Tonight's event is a joint effort between George Washington University and Politics and Prose. So I would like to thank the university for giving us this amazing space for what is sure to be a really inspiring talk. Jason Rezaian was based in Iran as a journalist beginning in 2009, before becoming the Tehran correspondent for the Washington Post three years later. On July 22nd, 2014, Rezaian's residence was raided and he and his wife Yegi were taken into custody. Soon, Rezaian was arrested under the charge of being an American spy. Originally thinking it was a terrible mistake, Rezaian tried to reason with the authorities and set things straight to no avail. He was blindfolded, handcuffed, and interrogated. He had no idea that he would be held as a prisoner for the better part of two years. He was essentially used as a bargaining chip in negotiations for the Iran nuclear deal. On the day of his release, America delivered $400 million in frozen accounts to Iran. Rezaian's book, Prisoner, is as much a thriller as it is a memoir. It recounts the threats of physical torture by his captors, the unrelenting charges by the Iranian government, and the psychological warfare his jailers put him through. Unfortunately, though, Rezaian's story is not a singular one. Iran continues to take American hostages, including most recently Michael White, who was traveling with a valid visa to see a woman with whom he had fallen in love. Before his untimely death, Anthony Bourdain called Prisoner an important story. Harrowing and suspenseful, yes, but also it's a deep dive into the complex and egregiously misunderstood country with two very different faces. There is no better time to know more about Iran. And Jason Rezaian has seen both of those faces. In part, Rezaian hopes that this book will shed light on the peril American journalists face abroad, and it will encourage the current administration to do more, to try harder, to bring American hostages back home to their families. Rezaian will be in conversation tonight with Frank Cessno, also an American journalist, former CNN correspondent, anchor and Washington bureau chief, and director of the School of Media and Public Affairs right here at George Washington University. Cesno is also the creator and host of Planet Forward on PBS and author of the book Ask More, The Power of Questions to Open Doors, Uncover Solutions, and Spark Change, of which we have copies for sale out in the lobby. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage Frank Cesno and Jason Rezaian. You got a good crowd. Yes, it's great. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, Jason, welcome back to GW. Welcome to all of you, to GW, and to a conversation that um, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, many of you have the book. I'm going to do something, though, that I don't normally do when I host someone here, which we do a lot, and that is um, glance down at a note or two for, some, for my own opening comments, because Jason is a remarkable person. And for us, this is a family affair uh, here at GW. For two years, Jason was a distinguished Turker fellow, spending time in our classes, meeting with students, faculty, participating in salons, on campus, at my home, and events here on campus, living on campus. Um, I remember our first meeting. Jason was clearly climbing back, 544 days in an Iranian prison. And it was going to be a long climb. But he was back, and he was here, and he was ready. And he talked about his wife, Yegi. Where is Yegi? There is Yegi. And I said, I'd so like to meet Yegi. And he said she needed just a little more time. And I want you to think about, as we have head into this conversation with Jason, what it would be like if someone picked you off the street for doing your job, threw you into solitary confinement, kept you isolated so you had no idea what was going on in the outside world or what was being done to help you or where your wife was or your husband and you were threatened with execution. Jason is part of our family, but he's also, and I think this is what's in the book and you're gonna hear about it, 
a leading member in what I want to call the family of freedom. The freedom to think, to write, to move about, to pursue information, to share it with others, and to be committed to truth. Now, the great irony of, of all of this is that Iran arrested and abused a man and his wife who actually deeply love Iran, who have great respect for its people, its culture, its history, and hope for a world in which it can be a great and civilized nation. So that's the story of the man in this book, and I want to start by acknowledging that, and Jason and Yegi, members of our GW family. So once again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I want to say one thing uh, that most people don't know. Um, when Frank uh, gave us the wonderful opportunity to come and live here on the campus and, and be a part of the community, uh, it also became the place where um, I wrote most of this book. Just right down the street in a uh, university townhouse. Uh, some students here tonight, yeah? Are there other students here? Yeah? Uh, right across the street from Tonic. Uh, there's a... <laughs> There's a, a frat house or two right there. <laughs> Yegi and I were your neighbors across the street for about two years. Maybe you knew it. Maybe that's the didn't. next book. Yeah, that's another book. <laughs> and, you know, it was Yegi's first experience of living in America. And, and often on Friday and Saturday night, she would, um, you know, pull up the blinds and, and look uh, across the street to, um, you know, uh, kiddie pools filled with, uh, uh, I don't know. You could stop there. Shots or <laughs> <swipe up. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was a great introduction to America for Yegi, is what I'm trying to say. So thank you guys. It's been a, it's been a wonderful also, experience. Also, we should welcome, right, your brother Ali yes. and your mother Mary. Yes. So welcome here as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Jason, let's, let's talk about, about you in the book. I want to start right with the ordeal. And you're in prison, and you write the following coming from your, your jailer. Do you know why you are here, Mr. Jason? No, I said, turning my head in the direction of his voice. You're the head of the American CIA station in, your, in Tehran. You're a spy, and we have the proof. When you heard those words... I was completely incredulous. I thought to myself, this is not only a mistake, it's a joke. Um, Yegi and I had been taken from our home earlier that evening. I was blindfolded. We had been separated at this point. Uh, it had been about an hour, maybe an hour and a half since we were hauled away. And I just thought to myself, head of the CIA station in Tehran? Seriously? I'm a Washington Post correspondent. I've got full accreditation from, from this government here in Iran to to do this work in this country. And you'd been in, you'd worked with Iranian officials. You'd interviewed them, talked. Interviewed them, talked to them in, 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 the, in the days leading up to, to our arrest. I'd been covering the nuclear negotiations in Vienna just uh, the week before. So uh, it was a, a massive shock and um, frankly, something that I thought was a mistake that would be, you know, But is that what you expected out. to say? Did you think that you were being called in on trumped up charges and this was, uh, was that a, a surprise to you that you heard those words? I think by the time that I got to that room, this interrogation room with so many agents and being blindfolded, I realized that this was more than just, uh, you know, um, a minor infraction that they were uh, potentially accusing me of. But I didn't think that they would go all the way to the, you're the station chief. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a lot. Job. Yeah. What did you say? I said, you're wrong. This is just a mistake. I'm a journalist. I'm just a journalist. I'm here doing my job. Uh, literally, the day that we were arrested, uh, my wife and I were both journalists. We're given one-year extensions of our press pass uh, by the ministry that, that over, overlooks uh, uh, press affairs in the country. So, you know, we had been uh, approved by one section of the government and simultaneously targeted by another. Uh, and that was, um, that was a, a distinction that we wouldn't really understand for, for many weeks. And while they're saying these words to you, where's Yegi? Where's your wife? She's being held in, in another part of the prison. And did you know anything about her whereabouts? She came into the room very briefly. We had a, 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 a kind of a, 
a moment of uh, communication in which, you know, she made it clear that she'd already been changed out of her own clothes and, and put in the prison uh, prisoner's uniform. Um, and then she was hauled off. And I didn't hear from her for a very long time after that. And what were your jailers telling you, and what were you telling them about your role in Iran and the, this process of figuring out whether this was legit and gonna, you know, you're gonna be able to explain your way out of it right. or that this was just this open-ended thing. So I assumed that I'd be able to explain my way out of it. I, th I thought that at some point- This will be a couple days. Whatever. Reason will set in, other people will raise enough of a fuss, people in, in other ministries in the government will come forward and say, hey, you know, we know this guy as an established journalist in this country, it's a sensitive time of negotiations between Iran and, and the rest of the world over uh, the nuclear program. This is gonna you know, blow over and uh, they'll probably apologize at some point. It's four and a half years since I was arrested and nobody's apologized. So, so. I don't wanna ruin the ending, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> You're working on that. It's gonna be a while before we know what, what that outcome is. Some of, some of your interrogations were Borderline surreal. I think all of my interrogations but, were borderline surreal, but yeah. What about avocado? <sighs> this has come up a lot in the last few days. I didn't realize people would find this as interesting as they do. I, um, in 2010, I, I, I put together a kind of a tongue-in-cheek Kickstarter project uh, on the crowdfunding site uh, with the expressed um, intent of trying to bring avocados to Iran. Um, I, they don't at, grow avocados. They them. don't, and they grow. You know, there's there's probably a few Iranians here tonight, and they can tell you that Iran grows the best fruit and vegetables anywhere in the world. But for some reason, avocado is not part of the agricultural uh, bounty that exists in that country. So, you know, I wanted to know why that was. Um, I failed in, in in trying to raise the money for that that project. Failed miserably. Uh, but you know, uh, four years down the lo down the road, it became this massive charge against me that, you know, we don't know what this avocado project is, <laughs> but we know so it's was something. This code for something. It's code, it's code. And you know- Proves as, you're a spy. It, that was the proof that they needed. You know, that's all, that's what they kept telling me. This is all the proof we need. And you know, you have an option here of, um, of copying to all your crimes and telling us of all your other crimes um, to subvert our government um, or, or your, you're going to be executed, or at best, spend the rest of your life in this prison. One of your jailers is named Kazim. Yeah. And he says to you, around this avocado thing, it will be much better, and you write this, it will be much better if you tell us yourself than if we discover it. We must execute you, Jason. You don't give us any choice. We prefer to let you live, but you refuse to cooperate. How often were you threatened with your life? I would say that in the first four months, um, I was threatened um, every other day, right? You know, every other day. You know, it's a good cop, bad cop situation. In the interrogation. Yeah, and and but you know, more than that, uh, threatened with uh, with the murder of my wife, um, with you know the fact that we would never see each other again alive. Um, threats against other loved ones. And, um, you know, I mean, it's impossible to, um, first it's impossible to explain what that feels like the first time you hear that. But then over time you start to think that's not gonna happen. And then it becomes this vicious cycle of, well maybe, maybe they are gonna kill me. Uh, did, you, did you think that? In the, in the first weeks, I spent seven weeks in solitary confinement um, you don't know what to think. You're all by yourself in a tiny cell, a cell that's much smaller than this rug that, that you and I are sitting on. That was my whole world, except when they took me to interrogations, when they would blindfold me and lead me to another part of the prison. And then they would level all of these crazy accusations against me. And then they'd take me back to this tiny little cell until the next set of interrogations. Um, so it becomes a, a repetitive song and dance, um, and 
you very quickly lose your bearings you in write, a situation you like that. You write that they, you felt they were pushing you toward lunacy. That's, that's the intent. I mean, I think solitary confinement as a practice is designed to do just that. It's designed to drive you crazy. Designed to make you bend to the whims of your captors. That's what it's about. I started my journalism career, actually, um, very early on, covering the Iranian hostage crisis when mm. they took our diplomats hostage. I was based in London at the time and actually was at the Air Force Base when they came out. This is a 40-year-old story, Jason, taking hostages. Yep. You're now one. Why did you go to Iran? Why go to this country? Unfortunately, um, that 40-year-old story that, that you mentioned has been in the collective American psyche for all these years. Uh, and Iran has done very little itself to uh, dissociate itself right. from that. Um, but, you know, I had the opportunity to, uh, to travel to Iran. My father was from Iran. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the front row and my family, there's five people sitting in the front row that I've been in Iran with, um, over the years. Uh, and you know, to varying degrees, I think they will all agree, uh, that the, um, the everyday experience of being in Iran is very different than what we read about. That doesn't mean that the government doesn't do all of these treacherous things. They most certainly do. But there's this other story beyond that of the people of that country, uh, of, the, of the old culture, which you alluded to in the introduction, um, but also about where the, the society, and it's a very young society, is headed. And I thought to myself I could uh, help illuminate that discussion for American audiences. So that's why I went there. Um, and, you know, this thing that started 40 years ago, I mean, we're just uh, entering into the 40th year of, of the Islamic Republic. About three weeks from now, they're, right. they're going to celebrate, a, you know, the entering into middle age. Um, and they're still doing this very infantile thing, which is taking foreign people hostage. Um, and as you said, I, I mean, it started 40 years ago, but it didn't stop with me. Right. Um, since my release, other Americans have been taken, um, and and others um, we've learned about in the, in the months uh, and years since my release, and, and not just Americans, other other nationalities as well. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm fascinated. What one of the things Jason does in this book so well is to talk about how you coped with this insanity and cruelty, and you did some pretty remarkable things, like singing the American national anthem to your jailers. I had an opportunity. Could you take a, like, what was that all about? Look, these guys, you know, I, I, and I hope that most of you, maybe all of you, get a chance to read this book. Um, and, uh, and you'll see that these are not people that you can take completely seriously. Uh, and when you find yourself in a situation like that, you have to, um, I found this to be true, you have to find some humor in the everyday moment. Some people derive their strength from their ability to get angry or passionate about something. Uh, I derive my strength from from being able to laugh at things. And you know, here you're these, in solit solitary confinement and finding them. It was very hard to laugh in solitary confinement, but as time went on, uh, and I would come out of of solitary and go into these interrogations, I thought to myself you know what, these guys have control over my whole life. Nothing that I'm saying is moving me any closer to the exit. Um, you know, let's, let's squeeze out, uh, you know, whatever mirth we can from this situation. Uh, and fortunately, I was able to write about it afterwards. So, so tell us about the singing. Yeah, so, you know, they, they had taken me in. This was maybe two and a half months into my imprisonment. And they made me read all sorts of statements on camera, which is a you know signature move of hostage takers, right? Uh, to produce confession videos and and share with the world, presumably, or on Iran state television in this instance, which they never actually did. Um, but at the end of this interrogation, one of them said to me, "Hey, we we we've interrogated some of your friends too." 
and uh, they say you're a great singer. Uh, they said I mean, that to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're messing with me, right? I said, nobody said I was a great singer. <laughs> I like to sing, you know? I like to sing karaoke. I mean, you know, we talk about Iran as this very kind of closed off society, but we had a friend who had a karaoke set. And, you know, you would have these great, lavish karaoke parties every few weeks. And we'd go and, and sing. So they asked me to sing, and I thought to myself, screw these guys, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> you know? We, we've never we heard that? that here. All right. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to give in to their, their demands. You know, they're, they're really trying to uh, disgrace me and, 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 and you know, kind of take my dignity from me. So well, I said, okay, but you got to stand up, right? You said that to them? Yeah, you just got to stand up. And so I, I, you know, I launched into... Did they stand up? They did. There's four of them in the room and they stood up and I launched into the Star Spangled Banner and the lead interrogator said, that was so emotional, and your voice cracked, <laughs> and it was, what was that, you know? I said, well, that's the American national song, and you guys just, you know, paid the ultimate respect to the great Satan. Um, uh, you better be careful, you know? I'm, I'm in prison for less than that right now. Um, to which they reply? Now it's time to go back to solitary. So, <laughs> You know, so, you know, it was, um, I, I make light of these things because I have to, uh, but in those moments, it's all I had. At what point did you actually know what the charges were against you, and what were they? So, initially, I think it was in December of 2014, after I'd been in for about five months, they took me to what they called the final defense, right? And this is the last sort of pre-trial session. And this is when they told me that I was being accused of spying for the American government, uh, coming to Iran under the, the, the guise of being a journalist, but rather, in, in fact, being a spy, uh, propaganda against the establishment, um, offensive remarks against the supreme leader of Iran, a charge that was ultimately dropped. Uh, the other one stuck. Um, and, um, and a whole slew of, of kind of national security crimes that don't really exist, right? that aren't on the books. And, you know, what's, you, you, you appear before the judge, Salavati, who's his mm. name, I believe, who, whom you refer to as the judge of death. This is somebody with a reputation, right? It's not me referring right, to him. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the world's that's his, opinion that's of his, him. Yeah, I mean, this guy has, um, has signed the, the execution orders of, of over 600 people. Did you know that when you appeared Of course. Before? You did? Of course I did. Yeah, I mean, this is a well-known figure. He's on every, um, you know, EU and U.S. sanctions list for, for human rights violations. So what are you thinking when, you, when you're, be, you're hauled into this guy's courtroom? Well, at first I was very scared. And... Um, and then I saw him, and I thought to myself, "Wow, this guy is a Neanderthal." You know, this is <laughs> you're right. You know, he's like one of the dumbest people in the world, or something. I mean, yeah. I mean, this not this guy is no genius. My mom had a lot of interactions with him, trying to you know uh, talk sense into the guy, and he was um, he was just a you know he's a paid goon of the regime. Uh, and when I started to kind of understand what his role in all of this was. I was nervous, but at the same time, I knew that um, when there are these cases of foreign nationals being detained in Iran, they almost always end up in his courtroom. Um, and that, that means that, uh, that Iran is trying to elicit or, or squeeze something out of the other country. Um, it's a sign, almost, right? That, that you know, we're putting you in front of the judge who's responsible for the executions of the most people in our country's history. Uh, well, maybe not in history, but you know, he's yeah. the judge most responsible for, for signing execution orders. If you want your national back, you better play ball. So you think it was more a signal to the outside world? Yeah. That, yeah. And what was your uh, understanding of what was happening on the outside world? Your mother came and, and had, some, had some access. By that time, when the, when the trial actually started in um, May of 2015, uh, and it went on for three months. We had four sessions spread out over a three-month period. 
um, I, I knew bits and pieces of the campaign that was uh, going on to uh, try and win my release. I couldn't see any of it, right? I mean, you know, I didn't have access to all of the things that, you know, you all had access to here. Uh, but my mom and my wife would, would be able to come and visit me and, and offer me bits of information. Sometimes I didn't believe them. You know, at one point, Yegi told me that Muhammad Ali had issued this statement calling for my release, and I just thought to myself, if that's true, that's about the coolest thing. <laughs> you also had some, had a little, you, you dropped names, his name. Yeah, I mean, and look. What, what effect did that have? I mean, so I didn't have to drop the name, because that was reported in the Iranian press. They were so upset about that, because, you know, here in America, we think of Muhammad Ali as this great American hero. Well, in the Islamic world, they think of him as a Muslim hero, right? And so in Iran, he's somebody that's uh, as lionized as he is here. So here's this guy that, you know, all Iranians consider a hero, saying that this guy that, that, that our government's holding as a hostage should be allowed to come home, right? It confused people. And, and I think it really made the authorities there angry. It made the authorities there angry. Yeah, well, yeah, because they were fighting a losing PR battle. In this case against me, in this propaganda campaign that they mounted around me being a spy, you know, the, the efforts of, my, of the Washington Post, uh, of my big brother, of the National Press Club, uh, you know, on down the line, drawing in people like uh, Muhammad Ali and... Uh, Noam Chomsky uh, was somebody else who came out pretty adamantly. Again, somebody that the Iranian authorities respect very much. Um, it was sort of a tough thing. And, and even one of the Kardashians, I heard after the fact, <laughs> tweeted about me. I think she thought I was Armenian, but uh, <laughs> um, but I'll take it. I'll take it. And you had a lawyer. I mean, so here's this kind of bizarre world of Iranian courtrooms and quote-unquote justice, and you have a lawyer. What was that like, and what was the effect? So I met the lawyer one time before the trial started. And one time? One time. In that meeting, Salavati, the judge, was in the room. Um, with you and your lawyer? With me and my lawyer and an official translator. Uh, and several of the members of, of, um, of the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard team, that were my captors. Right. So there was no... No creating a defense, no, you know, uh, attorney pr client privilege, none of the things that, that, that we all expect. Was it a real lawyer? Was I think so. A real lawyer? I mean, I think she was a real lawyer. I mean, and it was a woman. She was a woman, yeah. And what and, effect did that have? I mean, I think Yegi and I, she said we should get a female lawyer, uh, because they will be, you know, you know, in, in a lot of places in the world, but Iran especially, um, you know, guys kind of get goo goo for ladies sometimes, right? You know, uh, so when there's a, a younger woman walks in the office, they don't really know how to deal with with her. And I think she was able to really kind of push the buttons of the system and and get access to my case file for a longer period of time than she would have if she was a male lawyer. Uh, so I think it was an advantage to us. Was she really representing you? She couldn't really represent me. I mean, she wasn't allowed to see me. She wasn't allowed to talk to me. So what was, what was her role in this, in this court? I think more than anything, as I look back on it now, her role was to kind of witness these ridiculous trial sessions and come out afterwards and say, this is what happened in the courtroom. My, my client was not given an opportunity to defend himself. I was not given an opportunity to defend my client. Uh, the charges against him are baseless and there's no evidence. And she did that at great personal risk. Um, and... Uh, you know, on that count, I think she did a heck of a job, but ultimately, you know, her job was not uh, to really defend me in court. She was defending me in the court of Iranian public opinion more than anything else. As absurd as this trial was, and as much of a show trial as the Iranians were using it to be, you wrote that during the months of your trial, I came close to saying uncle many times. Look, they told me, plead guilty, and this will all go away. We'll, we'll pin a heavy uh, sentence on you, and within a few days, you'll be released. You know, people talk about this, you know, as a face-saving measure or whatever. 
and you, it's a gamble, right? Because you look back into the history of people that have been taken by authoritarian regimes, and there are precedents for people who, uh, who, um, who plead guilty, are convicted of, of you know, high crimes, and go home a couple of days later. But my wife wasn't going to let me do that. And uh, she said, look, we're in a situation here where uh, we've been messed with for so long. Um, you haven't done anything wrong and neither have I. You got to keep fighting this. So when I finally went into the courtroom in those four sessions, I think my interrogators fully expected that I was going to plead guilty. And then they, their hand would be even stronger than it was before. Um, but at every point, I just said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And then they would take me back to, to prison afterwards. You know, my attitude was each time I left the prison, which was rare, in the entire year and a half I was there, I probably left the prison wall, walls, you know, eight times, nine times to go to different court sessions. Every single time I did whatever I could to, to kind of shout as loud as I could that I haven't done anything wrong. Everything that, that they're doing to me is being done under duress. I'm being psychologically tortured here. I'm being deprived all of my rights. You say that you're a system based in Islamic rule and it's the most compassionate system in the history of the universe. I'm telling you my experience is something else. Um, and uh, I think they hadn't seen anything like that before. What did you know about what was going on on the outside world in the Iran nuclear talks? on behalf, in efforts to get you out, efforts by the U.S. government. You actually had a television yeah. at some point when you came out of solitary. So I did. I had an Iranian state television, <clears throat> which is sort of a very opposite thing than, yes. than your experience here. So I realized that when I heard them saying terrible things about me on Iranian state television, it must mean that something good was happening for me on the other side of the world, right? That, that people were raising my name in a more positive way that, you know, he needs to be released. Because every time there was a call for my release, they would come back with say, you know, no, it's time to execute him, right? That, that was their response. I'm to not that. sure I understand. How could you watch this in your cell on Iranian TVs and hearing things like that and connect that to? When my wife would come and tell me that, you know, okay. uh, sitting next to my wife is my friend Major Garrett, who, uh, you know, had one of the, the highlights of, I think, my entire uh, experience in, uh, while I was in Naveen that I never saw until after I came out, this, this back and forth that he had with President Obama about uh, signing the nuclear deal and, and, uh, and, and leaving Americans behind. And I think in those moments, every time that you know, my name got closer and closer to the epicenter of those negotiations, uh, my chances of coming home safely increased. Talk about the nuclear, <clears throat> the nuclear talks that were that were going on, involving all these countries, and you were a part of that indirectly, though it may have been. Obama didn't mention it directly, and should have, and that was the point of the question. But you were a piece on that chessboard of of very big power politics. Yeah, I mean, I became one. Right. You know. Um, I think that, that it wasn't a foregone conclusion on day one that I was arrested that that was, was, was going to happen. But um, this thing dragged on for so long, and there were so many moving parts. I mean, there was you know, the fate of the nuclear program, the sanctions that the U.S. had on Iran, uh, Iranians in prison in America, Americans in prison in Iran, uh, the future of Iran's ballistic missile program, money that, you know, that the U.S., uh, had taken from Iran and, and Iran in, in, the, in the late 1970s that Iran had sued over in international courts. All of these things were, were being negotiated in separate corners of Europe uh, over a couple year period. Um, and it all culminated on that last day. And, you know, when you look at having been a pawn on this chessboard, I don't like the term pawn. Okay. I mean, aren't there bigger pieces on the chessboard? As far as I'm concerned, you're the king, but you decide what to... <laughs> What's the horse called? Is that the pawn? Is that it's something... The, like... the knight. The, the knight. You can be whoever you want. Knight, whatever. You can be a bishop. I just don't want to can... be the pawn. I just call me okay. something else. Duly noted. Whatever piece you are on the chessboard... Thank you. What, 
What did you What did you know of the progress of the nuclear deal? Did you know that it was yeah. coming to fruition? Well, yeah, because and did you think, okay, I'm out of here when yeah. this thing's done? And, I mean, I thought, like Major did, and like my big brother and my wife and my mom and probably a lot of other people here, that the day that the, that the Obama administration entered into that deal on July 5th, 20, whatever, of 2015, um, I'd come home. And that didn't happen. Uh, we found out later that there were secret negotiations going on, you know, during that entire time and going back to just a couple of months um, after I was taken. But that period of time between July of 2015 um, and, and my release six months later was a really... Six months later. Six months later. It was a really low time because I'm thinking to myself, I didn't get out then. They're going to start implementing this deal, you know, because they sign it and then there's a period of time before it goes into action. If I don't get out when they implement this thing, there's no chance of me getting out. And that's borne out by, by the facts as we see them. Everybody that's still in prison in Iran, there were a couple of Americans who didn't come out when I came out. They're all still in prison three years later. Every single one. Did you have days when you thought you would be one of those forever? 100%. 100%. It's the thing that, you know, thankfully, I have fewer nightmares now than, than I did in the, in the weeks and the months after my release. But when I do have a nightmare, it's always the same thing. You were supposed to get out and you didn't. And you're still there. Yeah, 100%. I think I'll always be there. You write um, that, and you write it in a, in a kind of interesting passive voice way, that extraction plans had been explored. What does that mean? I learned later on that, um, you know, several, several private individuals and also uh, former uh, government officials had talked about and looked into the possibility of trying to extract me from Evin prison, but that it was ultimately decided that, uh, that it was too risky an operation that I probably wouldn't survive. Um, and I'm thankful that, that, that none of those were implemented. Although at the time, I was thinking to myself, you know, when is the, uh, when is the, um, the long rope of uh, dirty socks going to, you know, come down? And I think that was probably the only time in my life I could have held on for, for dear life. You know, I was, I was in great prison shape at that point. What do you make of the uh, administration's decision to walk away from this nuclear deal? I think it's their prerogative to do what they're going to do with Iran. You said or Iran any was still fomenting terrorism. It was all those things may, all those things are true. Okay, all of the things that Iran is being uh, accused of have been true for many years and continue to be true. But that wasn't what that deal was uh, signed about. You know, it was a deal to curtail Iran's nuclear ambitions, which we said uh, was designed to uh, ultimately uh, result in a nuclear weapon. We stopped them from doing that. That's what that deal was about. So it's sort of like saying, you know, we traded, uh, you know, LeBron James for Kobe Bryant, uh, and then now we don't want that deal anymore because you know, we didn't get Shaquille O'Neal in the deal too, right? five years down the road. It doesn't work like that. We made a deal. We need to stick with it if we want people to take our deal seriously. That's what I think. What effect does it have on the Iranians, do you think? I think it has a drastic effect on their, their psyche, you know, because the, the sanctions have all been re-implemented since we pulled out of the deal. The, the economy in Iran is getting worse and worse. Uh, at the same time, we've also implemented this travel ban uh, that is... Uh, affecting Iranians more than it does any other nationality. Um, so I think people feel like that they're, they're kind of backed into a corner and they don't have a lot of good options and they don't have a lot of good prospects. Um, so that's, you know, it feels rather disingenuous when we hear uh, people in this town saying that, you know, we're, we're supporting the aspirations of the Iranian people by sanctioning them. So the Hawks would say to you, look, it was the sanctions and the, and the collapse of the economy that forced or that prompted the Iranians to agree right. to the nuclear deal. So let's do it one more time. Right. 
Until they finally collapse and go away? Until they stop doing their terrorist activities. They're not going to stop doing their terrorist activities. They're not going to stop doing the things that they uh, have been doing all of these years uh, just because we make their lives more difficult. That, that didn't happen last time. It's never happened. It's 40 years that they're doing the same stuff. So where do you, you know, having lived there, knowing people, knowing this place, where do you see U.S.-Iranian relations going? Um, I don't think they're going anywhere good anytime soon, but I also don't think that we're headed towards any kind of military confrontation. Do not. I don't. I think that there are people uh, that would love to see that happen, uh, but I, but I, I'm hopeful that, that cooler heads uh, will prevail on that front. Um, ultimately, I think that the hope for Iran is within the Iranian society, uh, and I think it's a very educated and young population that has aspirations to connect with the rest of the world and be a part of the global economy and, you know, enjoy the, the, uh, all of the resources and, and possibilities of the modern world. And they've been denied some of that. And I think that they don't want to be denied too much longer. How many in the room have been to Iran? A lot. A number. A lot. It's a lot. So some of the pressure points in Iran, the big one, right, is this tension between all these young people. Right who have aspirations, you know them, you wrote about them, you reported yeah. about them, and the government. Is that something that can be roiled with these sanctions? Is that something that can be used to prompt change? I think that um, that's, the, that's the ultimate question within that society. What do you think? I mean, I think that there are two sets of people within the, in the system uh, vying for ultimate control. Uh, on the one side, you have people that, that think that Iran should be a self-contained country cut off from the rest of the world that can, you know, feed and clothe and give itself energy and protect its borders uh, and doesn't need to have relations, uh, integrated relations with the rest of the world. And then another group who thinks, you know, if we're going to survive, we have to satisfy the needs and aspirations of our people and at the same time be connected uh, to the global economy. I think... If that, that latter group were to prevail, the system will not last forever. If the former group of, of those who want to keep the country shut off from the world end up prevailing, I think that the short and medium term future uh, of the people of Iran is going to be more miserable than it already is. Mm -hmm. I don't, you're going to have to read the book to know how Jason actually got out. So we'll, we, won't, we won't give that That's away. That's good. Thank Probably. you for saving that one. Yeah, That's I'm good. not going <laughs> to. That's good. But there was some really weird last-minute stuff at the airport that was going on. There was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So give a little hint about this. So, um, you know, in those final moments, um, it turned out to be about 24 hours, um, we were told that we were going to leave the country um, myself and, and two other Americans who were um, being held in a different part of the same prison that I never saw. Um, and we were brought to the airport. And I was told that, that my wife was not going to be allowed to, to leave with me. And she was supposed to be. You were expecting that that was going to be part expecting, of the package. I was expecting, well, but, but I, was told, I was told often by my captors that she would join me later. Um, and it turned out she was supposed to leave with me that night. And I don't want to take it any farther than that. Um, you acknowledge, I mean, several things in this book. But one is Anthony Bourdain. It's an Anthony Bourdain book. Brittany mentioned this in the introduction, mentioning his name. This was a special relationship for you. And I invite you to reflect on the role that Anthony Bourdain had in your experience and in your life. So we, Yegi and I had the opportunity to appear on his show when he came to uh, Iran in 2014. It was about five weeks before we got arrested. Um, and it was sort of a chance opportunity that, that fell into our laps and one that we um, jumped at, as anybody would. Um, we, were, we were asked to come to a restaurant and, and shoot an interview with him. And we did, and it was... It was wonderful. We sat there for a couple of hours in this very idyllic setting over Tehran, high in the mountains with streams going down. Um, some of you probably seen that episode. Um, and then we were arrested. And it had nothing to do with 
with, uh, with appearing on the show. But obviously a lot of people thought that it did. And uh, he, was, he was faced with questions about that uh, for a long time, you know, throughout my detention. Whether he, that, he, whether that had something to do with it. And the implication that a lot of people had was that, you know, it was, it was because you were on the show that, or they, 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 the resigns profile. were on your show that raised your profile that, that had you taken in. But he became one of the very vocal advocates for our freedom. And CNN aired that episode over and over again. That clip of Yegi and Tony and I having a conversation was, uh, I think, kind of the foundational piece of news reports about us for a long time. Um, so it really helped raise our profile to a level that, that it wouldn't have been raised to if, if there was no encounter like that. Um, and after we were released in 2016, I, one of the first things I did when I went back to the Bay Area um, was I wanted, I wanted to have a burrito, right? And I had talked about you know, missing burritos when I was on his, um, on his show. So I, I had Yegi take a picture of me eating my first burrito in Freedom. And I tweeted it and you know, tweeted it at him. And he responded within a couple of seconds. And we had some messages back and forth. And a couple of weeks later, Yegi and I were in New York. Uh, and we had dinner with him in New York. And it, it was sort of, it was a second meeting that we had with him. Um, and this crazy thing had happened to us in between. Uh, and what we didn't realize is we had this incredible advocate and friend the whole time that, that I was in prison. Um, and he became a great an important friend to us, and ultimately, when it, when I decided that I wanted to write a book, he made it clear that he was going to support me however he could. Um, and I, you know, I had multiple offers from different publishing houses to do it, and um, for a lot of reasons, mostly personal, his was the best offer. You know, that he was going to um, help shepherd this thing to um, to publication. So. Um, when he died a few months ago, I mean, I think Yegi and I have had a lot of difficult situations in these last three years, but um, that was really the most heartbreaking thing that, that, that was happened to us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's something that um, that you know, when you see him on TV, when 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 he comes on, you hear his voice, you know, both of us just sigh and you know, oh, Tony, why, where are you, you know. Um, and, and it'll be a big hole in our life forever. I'm going to go to your questions in a moment, but I want to ask you this one last question, uh, Jason, before we do. And there'll be mics out. You have been through an incredible experience that has torn you from your family, made you wonder about whether you're going to survive, reduce you to whatever chess piece you were on a, on a board that was bigger than any of us. Um, I'm the horse. I'm the horse yeah. on the board. <laughs> Yeah, a racehorse. A racehorse. Um, the world went to bat for you, much of the world anyway. Mm. You've written about it now. You've thought about it. You've had a lot of recovery. You still have recovery to go, I know. How has this affected what you want to do with your life and how you want to define purpose in your life? I mean, I, I think... The first thing that I want to um, do is to uh, properly put this experience in, in the rearview mirror. Uh, and I think that, that I'm hoping that, that this book and this period of time talking about this story, we're able to do that. And that Yegi and I are able to um, establish ourselves, establish our, our lives here in the U.S. in a way that... Um, that we're known and remembered for uh, what we're able to do and accomplish rather than what was done to us. And I think we're moving in that direction. Um, but you know, the issues around press freedom and the attacks on the free press around the world, uh, you know, I, I never signed up to be a, a press freedom defender, but I was thrust into that situation and I have a platform that I can use now. Uh, at the Washington Post and at CNN, where I can write about and talk about these issues uh, in, in greater depth because I've experienced them. 
And, um, you know, if, if I am able to do nothing else other than uh, promote the idea that everybody should be able to express themselves the way they want to, uh, write about news that's happening around the world uh, safely and, and without threat, if we can make it a, a safer world for journalists than it is right now, um, I'd feel really good about taking part in, um, in anything to do that. And we re feel really good that you're part of our family, Jason. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a couple of microphones that I think are going to come out. There we go. And if you have a question for Jason, we would invite you to um, make your way to the microphone. Uh, we would invite you to introduce yourself, ask your question as briefly as you can so we can get as many people to the mic as are brave enough to, to come down. So I want to give one shout out if I can. Is my Please. friend Gabriel still here? Yeah. Where is he? Hi, Gabe. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> There's Gabe. Thanks for coming. All right. Question, please. Go ahead. Um, hi, Jason. I'm uh, Bethany Allen Abrahamian, um, a journalist here in D.C., and I'm so thrilled to finally be able to see you in person. I'm more than thrilled to be able to read your book, and I'm just so glad that you're here safely. Um, Thank you. I followed, you know, every four, 544 days of your um, d detention and... Um, look forward to reading to your, reading your book. I, I have a question about journalism in Iran. So, I mean, what can you talk a little bit about the state of journalism, both for uh, for Iranian journalists and for foreign correspondents there? Yeah. Um, because we think of, of, of course, it's not a free environment, but there are still spaces there where reporting can be done. And I'm curious about how that reporting can be done. Um, you know, what are the spaces and how, how do those borders change of, of what's safe and what's not safe and how do you know? Uh, and then in terms of foreign correspondence, um, well, the only one I can think of who writes in English is Thomas Erdbrink. And I, I'm curious if you have any insights into how he has been able to be there for so long. And um, without, I mean, you know, his, his wife is Iranian. How is, how is her family safe? I don't know if you can talk about that in a public space. It would you know, be good for him, but if yeah. you can. So I think that, that you know, the state of Iranian journalism has, um, has ebbed and flowed over the years. And you know, since my arrest, it's no coincidence that the number of Tehran bylines for foreign news outlets has plummeted, right? Not, not only in terms of you know, Yegi and I being uh, taken out of the scene. I mean, we were two regular contributors to you know, international news on Iran, but also um, the um, the atmosphere and fear of of people that that continue to work there uh, and have had uh, new restrictions undoubtedly imposed on them. Um, you know, I can tell you about a time right after I started working for the Washington Post in 2012. I had my uh, press credential uh, temporarily suspended. I didn't know why. And um, I went to the press ministry. You know, it took me a couple of weeks to get a meeting with the head of it. And um, uh, I, I sat down with, with him and he said, you're here because you want to know why you don't have a press credential this week, right? And I said, yeah, I didn't do anything. He said, well, you either um, wrote something that was contrary to our national security interests uh, or you crossed over one of our always changing red lines. Uh, and I can't remember right now which one it was. Um, so that's the attitude. Um, I, I think that there is, it, it's not fair to say that there's no journalism being done in Iran. There is some, but it's very limited in scope. And there's so much disinformation put out by the state media in Iran. Um, so, you know, I was uh, the victim of a massive state disinformation campaign through the official media channels of that country. At the same time, I know a lot of people who work for state media outlets who uh, are doing their, their very best to report, uh, to report accurately and honestly what, about what's going on in the country. And if they're not able to do it through their own networks or newspapers or websites, 
they find other ways to get that information out. So it's a, it's a very kind of organic um, situation. And I don't think that there's much from the outside that we can do to help promote that. As to, you know, how people are able to survive for periods of time, I thought I was doing pretty well for, you know, five years of, of being able to, to write pretty consistently uh, from there. Um, but I, I think what happens is every, everybody's situation and circumstances are individualized for them. Um, and it would, it would be, you'd be hard-pressed to, to find out the backstory on somebody else's situation. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Susan, and I'm a stay-at-home mom from Vienna. Nice. I followed your story in the Thank Washington you. Post for a long time. And my question for you is, how did you pass the time in solitary confinement? What did you think about? What schedule did you set for yourself to help you get through each day? They kept a pretty tight schedule for me. Uh, you know, around 6.15 in the morning, they would come bang on the door and tell you that you couldn't sleep anymore. Um, so, you know, if you were able to sleep, you slept at night. You know, there was no napping or anything like that. They wanted you to be awake and in your cell, um, you know, contemplating your navel or whatever you could. Or getting uh, scared and getting disoriented. Exactly. And feeling the walls move. Exactly. So, you know, there's not that much of a routine that you can get yourself into. What I did, and I think a lot of people do this. I've talked to other people who've gone through long-term confinement. I just paced. I walked because it's the only thing I could do. And I figured the best thing I can do here is walk and try and keep count, right? So I would do um, my repetitions in, in 100 counts. And if I lost count, I'd start over, right? And it just kept me mentally engaged. I revisited so many different moments in my life and conversations that I had and things that I regretted and things that, that um, you know, I, I couldn't make up for because those people that were involved are no longer with us and things that I could make up for. And I made lists, lots of lists uh, about the things I wanted to do when I got out. Th those lists, I mean, I'm still trying to notch some of those things off, but you know, uh, they were very helpful at, at the time to give me something to hope for. Next question over here, sir. My name is Nathan Weisler, and I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, Thank you so much for being here today. Um, one thing that I found particularly meaningful as I read, one, one thing that I found particularly meaningful is reading, is reading about how, is reading about how the American hostages in Iran, in Iran 40 years ago when they returned home, they were given gifts by many different people. Yeah. And I read about your father's interactions with the hostages and the context and the context of in the context of his business. And I, I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Um when the uh when the hostages were released um thirty eight years ago, uh just day before yesterday actually was the anniversary. Frank was covering it as a young cub reporter. Um, how old were you then, Frank? You were I was a cub. 13? I was a young cub. Yeah. <laughs> I, was a, I was a kindergarten reporter. Uh, <laughs> In my dreams. <laughs> uh, um, there was a massive outpouring of relief and appreciation um, that, that these Americans who had become you know, the subject of nightly news reports uh, for 444 days, um, there was this, this massive happiness, national happiness. And, and one of the things that came out of that was, I don't know who started it, but they, they started bestowing gifts on them. So, you know, the, the Hawaiian Tourism Board invited all the hostages to come for a week uh, to Hawaii. And, um, you know, Nebraska sent steaks. And um, uh, th there was lots and lots of stuff. And my dad, who was an Iranian-American businessman at that point, had a Persian rug business, offered all of them uh, a rug from his shop. Um, and he, cre you know, it was a very difficult time being an Iranian businessman. My, my mom can attest to that. Uh, it was a tough period uh, for any Iranian living in, in America at that time. Um, so, you know, he, he made this very public gesture and 44 of the 52 hostages took him up on it. 
We still have lots and lots of those um, thank you letters from, from the returning hostages. And it was just a, a thing that he could do as an American of Iranian origin to say, America welcomes you home. And as an Iranian, I'm very sorry for what my home country put you through. Thank you for your question. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Zion. Um, my name is Joe Ramal. I'm actually a GW student here at cool. SMPA. Yeah. Studying, uh, political communications. Great. Um, I just want to thank you for being here tonight. Thanks. Um, but the question I had was really, um, you had mentioned, you had really joked earlier that um, in a little while, Iran will be celebrating its 40th year in the Middle Ages. Right. My question really is, is that when are we going to get out of those Middle Ages? When are we going to be able to move on? You had said that the hope really lies in the young people. Yeah. So when and how do you see? I mean, look, I think, uh, well, I think what I, uh, what I was trying to say was it was entering middle age, you know, like, like Frank and me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the Middle Ages, you that's, so that's, you know, that's a good point, too. Now, I think that, the, that, you know, so many of the tools of modern life exist in Iran. Everybody's got a smartphone. You know, when I left... Um, you know, the last time I was free in Iran, uh, four and a half years ago, um, I had friends and relatives who didn't know how to turn on a cell phone. Um, now everybody I know in Iran, doesn't matter if they're, you know, seven or 75, uh, is using Instagram and, uh, you know, Telegram and WhatsApp and all of these other messaging apps. So, you know, I think that the rate of the, the society's uh, kind of catching up with the modern world the Iranian people are already there. Um, you know, it's just that these these sort of uh, frameworks of the law and, and and the religious leadership are holding them back from from really kind of taking their rightful place among the rest of modern countries. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jason. My name is Mora Vanderzan, and thank you so much for sharing your experiences about this terrible ordeal that you went through. I wanted to ask you about um, one of my father's former colleagues, Bob Levinson, who's sort of one of the forgotten prisoners in yeah. Iran, and just wondering if you have any theories as to what might have become of him and if you think there's any chance that he might still be a, cap a captive there or you know, should people still have hope or? I think people should always have hope until we know um, what happened. And uh, it's 11 years, more than 11 years since uh, Bob Levinson went missing, um, presumably taken by Iranian authorities. Um, and I think that um, his family deserves to know exactly what happened. No family should go through the kind of ordeal that, that, that his wife and children have gone through all these years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet them, uh, some of them, over the past few years. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's very disingenuous for the Iranian regime to say we don't know what happened to this person. Uh, and I would call on uh, the American government, other journalists, public, to try and do more to figure out what went, went on there. And my great hope is that, uh, that he's still alive and that he's reunited with his family. Uh, but the fact that they've had 11 years stolen from them, their lives put on hold, you know, people have been born into the families, others have died, grandchildren, you know, marriages, all of this sort of stuff. You know, we as a family experienced a fraction of that. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, uh, it's going to take years may, and maybe never we'll be able to put it all back together the way it was before. Uh, so my heart breaks for them. And, um, and I think that, that the government, um, in the last, this current administration, the previous administration and the one before that could have done a lot more, uh, to, to figure it out and, and hopefully bring them home. And I hope that happens. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Folks, we have time for just a couple more questions. I'm sorry we can't get to everybody, but I know that Jason wants to sign books, and you'd like to get your book signed, so why don't we make one question on each side? My apologies to the others. Go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Lynch. I work in international development here in DC. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, incredible story. Um, my question uh, to you is you mentioned how you unfortunately became kind of an unintended advocate for, you know, 
free journalism and free press um, without making it a like, overly political question here. Um, how do you see the state of kind of global free press? What, what, where do you see that trajectory going, uh, given the kind of interesting uh, political climate that's going on, not just here, but in a lot of other, you know, Western countries where, you know, issues of, you know, fake news and such kind of is propagated quite a bit. I think we're in a really bad uh, moment. Um, it, it didn't start with, you know, the atmosphere in, in America right now, but I think that uh, that this is a, a symptom of a larger problem that's happening in so many countries around the world. Uh, you know, we we had this perception several years ago that that uh, social media was going to help kind of level the playing field. I don't think people realized how much it would be used to disinform and, and become a, like a weapon of, of propaganda in so many corners of the world, a free weapon almost that anybody can use. Um, I, I think that the work that we do as journalists is probably uh, more vital and important than ever before. Um, and I think there's a lot of great journalism happening right now. And I know it's not a, a happy note to come close to ending on, but I also think that the work that we do uh, is having less of an impact than it has in a very long time. And I worry about that a lot. Last question from the floor. Hi, Jason. Um, my name is Mark. I'm a student in SMPA. Nice to see you, Mark. Good to see you. Um, so one of the things that we talk a lot about here at GW, um, and it is a big student concern, is mental health. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, because obviously you've had to really take care of your mental health um, with the ordeal you've been through. What advice would you give to students and everybody in the audience about maintaining good mental health? It's a great question. Um, I could tell you from my own point of view what's been helpful. Um, sleep. Uh, walking. Um, having some relations with, with uh, a few people that you trust, that you can talk to, share things with, um, spending less time with your cell phone. I fail at that sometimes, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think unplugging and moving your body uh, and uh, getting some distance from your, your various devices late at night is probably the best advice I can give anybody. Uh, and I think those are pretty simple things to do, but we, we often don't do them. Follow your example on that, Jason. Uh, a couple of last quick questions before we... I have we... a good question. Oh, <coughs> okay. <laughs> My name's Ralph Stevens. No, I, I, I'm curious. You, you have achieved heroic status, and I think everybody in this room uh, will acknowledge that because of your ordeal and the way you've dealt with it and, and the things you've told us tonight. And I'm wondering if you have plans uh, <clears throat> to use that in any way you can think of to assist people who continue to be uh, locked up in Iran to get out. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'll do whatever I can. First, first of all, I um, appreciate the compliments, but I, you know, I, I'm just a guy who survived a really tough situation and had a lot of people supporting me. What I would like to do uh, is be a similar kind of support for people who are in similar situations. So what I've tried to do is make my insights uh, available publicly and privately um, to help uh, inform folks about the circumstances of people imprisoned in Iran um, and what I think might be helpful to, to bringing people home. And I, you know, I've made myself available to anybody that wants to, to ask me about that. And I've also written about it in the Washington Post and talked about it at length on CNN and, and will continue to do that as long as there are Americans and other people of other nationalities being held there uh, for what I think are purely politically motivated reasons. Yeah. Okay, Thank well, you. Godspeed with that. Thank you. Thank you. Is that why you brought your lawsuit against Iran? Yeah. I mean, look, first and foremost, I was denied uh, every lever of justice that was available to me in that 
system. People say that it's a backward system and there's no laws. No, there are laws. Iran has a constitution. Uh, they threw me in jail and they threw the constitution away with it. They took away my right to defend myself. They kept me separated from my family. They locked me in solitary confinement. They uh, destroyed my name and my ability to work in a country that, that, uh, that I had a right to work in. Um, and so when I came out, I decided that, uh, that I had the right to seek justice. And the only place where I could do that was here in the courts of the United States of America. Um, so that's, that's the personal level. They wronged me and my family. Uh, and somebody needs to be accountable for that. But also, I hope that it's a deterrent in the future because they need to know that this is not the right thing to do. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't come up with a recipe in 40 years to stop them from doing this really terrible thing. Now, people will say to me, look, you know, you were taken hostage and that's not the biggest, you know, crime in the world. There are much more, uh, you know, horrific things to have happen to, yeah, sure. But you'll be, forgive me for taking this on as a cause uh, that matters to me. Um, and, you know, I'm going to push that forward as long as I can. And not just in Iran. No country should be doing this to people. It, it tears lives apart. It tears families apart. Uh, and, and, and nobody should be taken and turned into, you know, a piece of property for trade. Even if you are the horse on the, uh, on the, on the chair. Here, here. So one of the, one of the great things Jason does in this book is he, is he weaves all of these themes that you've heard here tonight about international relations, about his ordeal in a prison, about history and culture, and about people. So here's my last question. Uh-oh. You write that your jailer, one of your jailers at one point said, Jay, when you get out of here, we want to stay in touch with you. <laughs> Would that be okay? Look, uh, in the moment, I told him, do whatever you want to do. He just let me go home. And I think what I said to him was, uh, that, that, that depends, you know. Uh, and they said, depends on what? So if, they, if you let me out today or tomorrow, you know, there's a good chance we'll be talking. But I sat there for another year or so. Um, you know, I continue, jokes aside, I mean, I, I continue to get harassed by uh, people within the Iranian uh, system online. On Twitter, you can see it. It's there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know from other people who've been through these experiences, um, years on, they, they continue to be, um, targeted and, and, and harassed. But at the same time, I've lived a transparent life from the beginning. Uh, I'm not going to stop doing that now. So, you know, I'm, I'm here. My email address at the Washington Post is at the bottom of every article that I write, just like any other journalist. Uh, and people are going to send me emails if they want to. So, Jason, be that voice. Take this mission and go forward with it. And Thank you. stand for the freedom to, to express and to think, as we talked about. To your family, thank you so much for being the amazing human beings that you are. To Yegi, you know, amazing, amazing. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in thanking Jason and Yegi for their, sharing their story here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.